the Epsilon Queen. Although men have traveled hundreds of light years in every direction from our solar system, we have scarcely begun to learn the unfathomable vastness of our own galaxy, which is only an insignificant speck in the universe. Hundreds of ships regularly ply back and forth across the space lanes of our tiny corner without mishap, and as our technology advances, so the dangers of space travel diminish. But in a medium as complex and strange as the dark vacuum surrounding our planet, disaster is never very far away. It looked like a routine flight for the Epsilon Queen as she set out from Mars bound for the exotic playgrounds of Alpha Centauri III. This was a journey she had made many times as a luxury liner ferrying tourists and pleasure seekers from both worlds. And although now an elderly vessel, she had recently undergone a complete refit in the modern Martian yards. Inside her rejuvenated frame, the cabins and saloons were a curious mixture of ultra-modern facilities in charmingly old-fashioned settings, which in themselves attracted many travelers. Somewhat slower and normal pace than most of her young sisters, her unusual mixture of both pulse and ion drives could nevertheless produce a very respectable turn of speed. She even carried a fully operational chemical thrust line as an emergency drive unit, although it had never been employed. Her new hyperdrive unit was the last word in subspace propulsion, having only just completed the TTA safety clearance tests and was the pride and joy of the captain. While the passengers strolled among the elegant surroundings, or sampled the various entertainments designed to while away the many hours the trip would take, the officers and crew busied themselves with the familiar process of preparing the ship for a long jump. Computers hummed and ticked as the coordinates were fed in, and the drive generators worked up the power to slide the ship into the mysterious world of alternative space-time. A slight vibration, and the Epsilon Queen disappeared on her way. While the rest of the crew stood down, the captain, chief engineer, and the navigation officer remained on the flight deck, beaming self-consciously at each other, and remembering the shuddering and bumping that used to accompany a jump. The new equipment made it unnecessary for anyone to man their posts until the time came for re-entry, and the officers eventually left for the mess deck, leaving the captain to make his habitual round before joining them. As he passed the scanner console, he almost missed the slight flicker of a monitor display. Only his experienced eye would have registered the movement, and he stopped to peer at the reading. As he watched, the reading slowly increased, but the information it was projecting was impossible. According to the scanner, a large vessel was closing from behind on an identical course. He punched the alert call and turned back to the instruments in bewilderment. The approaching ship was moving faster than any craft ever built, military or otherwise. Seconds later, the crew began scrambling into their positions, and a complete scan and instrument check was carried out in record time. But the more data that was thrown onto the command console, the less sense it made. Not only was the craft traveling at an impossible speed, but its weight and mass were identical to those of the Epsilon Queen, down to the last decimal point. The final piece of information supplied by the warp sensors began to convince the captain that he had been overtaken by an unusually severe bout of space delirium. Every ship moving through hyperspace emanates an individual pattern of signal distortion, which is as distinctive as a fingerprint, and the print of the extraordinary ship bearing down on them exactly matched their own. Suppressing a surge of fear, the captain spun his heel and shouted a string of orders. Cabin staff raced through the ship to look after the passengers as the great liner jinked and swerved in an effort to throw off its pursuer, but to no avail. Suddenly, the signals officer called to the captain and handed him a headset, his face ashen and his eyes fixed on his superior's face. As he listened, the captain felt his blood run cold, and the sounds from the set seemed to echo round and round his head. Every word intercepted of the other craft's internal communications was clear as a bell, but the voices were only too familiar. They were those of his own crew. Every word spoken on the flight deck came back through the headset, and mind-boggling though it seemed, the Epsilon Queen was about to collide with the Epsilon Queen. As the captain turned to look at the confused face of the signals officer, there was a tremendous crash and he was hurled to the deck. With the Epsilon Queen's flight plan already registered in their data banks, the monitors in Alpha Centauri's warp exit zone awaited her arrival. 
Right on time, their instruments detected an emerging mass, but to the horror of the officers on watch, instead of the familiar, smooth-skinned form of the luxury liner, what materialized was a gutted and ruined shell trailing streamers of debris. The stern and one side had been torn out, and the distant stars shone through the gaping holes torn in the hull. The grim hulk was towed to the nearest TTA station, and the post-mortem began. Although the drive unit and generators had been reduced to fragments, the data banks and recorders were still intact, and gradually an explanation emerged. Somehow, the two generators which brought about the transition from real to hyperspace had not been correctly synchronized, despite the many checks, and the ship had been catapulted into a dual existence in the time-space continuum. In an effort to obey natural laws, the two representations of the one object had attempted to solve the paradox. The trouble was that each was as real as the other when the two projections finally met.